So uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second conference. And um, today we are going to like focus on uh, the dilemma of international community, the new Afghanistan. Uh, I'm Julia Miraglia and the new, uh, I'm the new ad coordinator together with my colleague, Francesca Martone. And Hello. I'm going to uh, briefly show you what ICMA is uh, for us and for the students. So ICMA is a non-partisan uh, and non-denominational student association, uh, which enjoys the patronage of the University of Bologna and the partnership with other numerous entities and bodies such as the European Commission. Uh, our motto, as you know, is by the student for the students, uh, in order to bring students from the academia to practice. Uh, this is why we also create, we always create uh, conferences and workshop and also contents uh, for our social media and we strongly invite you to, to follow us. Uh, all the events during this year uh, are preparatory to the ICMA Summit, uh, which will take place in May 2022. Uh, this, the summit is a great opportunity to um, uh, reach like a lot of students and to um, deal with international topics. Uh, before giving the floor to our moderator, Laura, I would like to inform you that to, uh, to ask questions uh, to the guests, uh, you can use the Zoom platform, uh, the chat below, and at the end of the first panel, uh, the speaker will answer to your question. So thank you very much and have a good time. Good morning and welcome everyone. My name is Laura Salvemini and I'm going to moderate the first half of our conference today. I want to welcome, of course, all of our guests, and, but I also want to thank all of you for being here and following us. So as you know, the topic of today's conference is the new Afghanistan, the dilemma of the international community. Indeed, we decided to focus on its new situation and how it, it affects, but at the same time is affected from the international community. In this conference, we will discuss about Afghanistan from the perspective of its international relations in order to have a different point of view of the situation in the country. Today, we have the honor of discussing this matter in our first half of the conference with two experts, which I'm very happy to introduce now. So the first one is Dr. Francesco Strazzari. He's a professor of international relations at the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in East, and also a professor at Science Euro uh, John Hopkins University. Dr. Tsatsari is specialized in peace and conflict studies with a focus on transnational organized crime in areas of Africa and the Mediterranean. Today is going to give us an insight into the new situation of Afghanistan and how it, it, this affects its international relations. Our second guest is Dr. Elisa Junki. She's a professor of history and institutions of Islamic countries and history of Asia at the University of Milan. And she's also the vice director of the uh, academic journal NAD. The main focus of her research are Pakistan and Afghanistan. She's also the author of a series of articles and books, including, for example, the most recent Il Pashtun Armato, La Militarizzazione dell'Afghanistan e il Declino dell'Impero Britannico, and Afghanistan, Dalla Conferenza Tribale alle Crisi Contemporanee. Today, she will discuss on the consequences of the Afghanistan situation on Pakistan and India, uh, so giving us a different perspective on the, on the dynamics between these countries and how they are affected from the most recent changes in the country. So finally, I just want to remind you that if you want to ask questions to our guests, you can leave them in the Zoom chat and we will then read them out loud. And uh, I just want to give a big thanks to our guests and without taking any more of their time, I'm going to leave the floor to Professor Strazzari for, for, sorry, for his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. Uh... Thanks for inviting me. It's uh, a pleasure as a, <clears throat> as a former student of the University of Bologna and uh, having a chance to evaluate uh, students uh, who apply from the University of Bologna. I'm uh, running a program in international security and I, I see uh, very interesting uh, uh, applications coming from. So I know you are doing an excellent job there. I think this conference is a uh, uh, somehow uh, part of the process that uh, you are doing. It's a, it's a pleasure and uh, at the same time it's painful today to address uh, Afghanistan in the middle of the winter. Uh, I would just like to sketch uh, and put a few things on the table uh, uh, 
to to for for Elisa who follows me, who's the real specialist, to possibly develop or uh, somehow comment. Uh, so a few analytical insights, starting from a, a very basic fact, that is that the war is over, which is sometimes forgotten. Uh, there's been a lot of media narrative saying so, who won, who didn't won. Uh, at the end, nobody wins. So that was a discussion, the tone when uh, the West. Uh, and the Americans and the Italians withdrew a bit in silence in the case of the Italians. Well, there's something but which is very clear the Taliban has have won. And that uh, is, we're not sure to what extent we can uh, greet that as an element of uh, fundamental discontinuity. There's a lot of discussion about the new Afghanistan, but if you look at the flag that uh, the Taliban showed on the day they took power in, uh, in uh, Kabul. Uh, what you see is a, a small writing under the white flag of the Islamic Emirate saying uh, since 1994. Uh, so that there's, a, there's a, a clear indication that uh, there is a, a, a kind of a longer term uh, story of the Islamic Emirate that we are facing not with uh, the new Emirate, but with the third Emirate. By the way, we don't even know whether uh, the, the Emir himself, um, uh, Sheikh uh, Isbatullah Akhundzada is alive. Uh, he's been announced to have uh, visited three cities. The last one was uh, Herat uh, last week, but uh, no pictures are coming about that. The country is in terms of in military terms relatively uh, uh, safe, uh, journalists can travel, we get news uh, through the virtual space of uh, WhatsApp with our colleagues. And yet, uh, the main threat now is the Islamic State of Khorasan, which is concentrated in the in the city of uh, Jalalabad in the Nangarhar uh, province, um, which is connected very much uh, with the dynamics that uh, are, are sweeping uh, uh, in the neighboring Pakistan, um, we are talking about some uh, 3,000, 4,000 estimated militants of the Islamic State of Daesh in Afghanistan itself, but we have a much bigger uh, army in terms of the so-called uh, uh, Pakistan's Taliban. We're talking about 10,000 minimum, while the uh, uh, Taliban uh, ha are, are squabbling still in terms of uh, uh, power. Now, when we talk about power, we need to understand that the concept of power has a longer uh, uh, teleological tradition, and that we are talking about an Islamic Emirate, which is different from the other Emirates, take, uh, I don't know, Qatar, that is very important for the diplomatic uh, game over uh, Afghanistan today. The, the Italian embassy, for instance, is, reloc is being relocated in, uh, in, uh, in, in Qatar itself because we're talking about an emirate that is not dynastic, but where power is uh, uh, debated and discussed in uh, broad uh, uh, collegial bodies that are inherited from the Pashtun world. Uh, traditionally, the, the, the uh, uh, you know, Taliban power is rooted in the city of Kandahar, but the winning faction right now, the one that prevailed, it is relatively clear a few months uh, after the, the takeover is uh, the one connected with the Akani network, which is not the Kandahar group. Uh, the Kandahar group has been uh, somehow contained in its uh, ambition to express also continuity vis-a-vis -vis the past. And there's a lot of debates about uh, to what extent uh, the Akanis are sponsored by Pakistan or are contained by Pakistan. These are big questions that uh, I can't solve today, but I just want to, to mention them. When we talk about power, we are talking about a conception of power that is uh, uh, something that uh, we, can't, we cannot isolate by looking only into Afghanistan. The, the victory of the Taliban against a much more powerful uh, military or techno-military uh, uh, deployment that is the one led by uh, the Americans and, and, and the West, uh, broadly, uh, uh, broadly spoken, is uh, something that speaks to a, a, the entire constellation of jihadism from Mauritania to Thailand. And uh, it's, uh, it, it speaks about the victory of the Al-Qaeda affiliated uh, uh, constellation, the network, although the relationship between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda 
are something that is a matter of speculation. But let's not forget that uh, a couple of years ago, already Al Qaeda in Afghanistan issued a declaration declaring victory in the name of the Islamic Emirate within and under the flag of the Islamic Emirate. So there's a lot of debate about to what extent Al Qaeda inside Afghanistan itself and in its broader articulation through local franchises, uh, let's say uh, in, in, in the Sahel, for instance, is being reinvigorated uh, discursively and in terms of, of legitimacy by the lesson that comes from Afghanistan, which is a lesson that we can sum up in terms of tactical, uh, um, tactical malleability and strategic persistence, strategic patience. Uh, the Taliban have been able to uh, uh, frame uh, a coalition with other groups. And if you look at their uh, propaganda, you can easily find it on Twitter of the Islamic Emirate, everything is a display of national unity one nowadays. There's little, uh, there's little uh, reference to uh, ideological or religious uh, 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 fuel, but there's a lot of display of how the Tajik and, and, the, and, and the Pashtun uh, uh, go hand in hand. Uh, and all of that, uh, in spite of uh, the, the internal fights of which uh, we know by a number of uh, indications, among others, the fact that on certain matters which are important for uh, national consensus for a Taliban, inter Taliban consensus, say the question of women education, girls, female education. Well, uh, the concessions that were announced are very slow to come. Now we're talking about perhaps in March, uh, uh, female uh, uh, students will be readmitted to schools, but uh, we see that uh, uh, as one of those very delicate courts uh, on which the Taliban are trying to play uh, uh, a symbolic uh, game inside their own ranks. When we talk about power, we talk about an idea, uh, which in, a, in the Quran, the idea of Sultan, power is expressed in terms of uniqueness of power. And a lot of the debate, internationally speaking, is one about sanction vis-a-vis -vis opening of the political system, the transitional uh, uh, government, towards an inclusive formula. Now, what does that inclusive mean is something which is very much a matter of uh, contestation. Uh, we know Turkey, for instance, uh, has been enjoying uh, uh, very constructive relations with the Taliban. It never left uh, the airport of Kabul, where you can find a huge Turkish flag. There are old relations between Erdogan and some Mujahideen uh, uh, um, fighting uh, uh, groups that are not the Taliban historically, but they are part of the Islamic party. And some of the discussion is whether uh, they would be included in a wider formula. Um, but the, 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 the Turkish uh, uh, government at the same time has not stepped into what is the main uh, issue that the Taliban is, are raising internationally, which, are, which is the uh, recognition of the Islamic Emirate as the legitimate government in control of the territory. And therefore, much of the display of safety on, the, on um, Afghanistan, the Islamic ter uh, Emirates territory, is made by the Taliban power in terms of showing we are the one power here, and uh, why shouldn't be, we be uh, recognized in terms of the UN? This is one of the two uh, very con uh, con con um, uh, controversial issues at the UN now, along with Myanmar uh, and, and the representation of Myanmar in the General Assembly. And not only the General Assembly, but also the embassies abroad. There was a fight at the embassy in Rome uh, uh, 10 days ago about who should speak for, for Afghanistan and, and so on and so forth. In the, at the same time, as I said, the emir, that is the, the, the element of uh, uh, unity, the symbol of this continuity of the state. Uh, let's for, not forget when we talk about uh, Afghanistan, we're talking about a state marked by discontinuity, five types, not of government, but of states over the past 40 years of war. Eh? We moved from uh, you know, uh, 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 People's Republic uh, that was uh, uh, um, propped by, by the Soviet, uh, then into uh, Islamic State. That was the name that was uh, given by the uh, uh, Taliban when they took over in the 90s. Uh, and then we have uh, a new uh, 
configuration of power in the name of the is, uh, Islamic uh, um, Emirate uh, under the Taliban when they when they took power in the late uh, 90s. Finally, we have uh, 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 the attack by the invasion by the UN, uh, sorry, by the US and uh, that uh, created uh, Islamic Republic and now again the Islamic State. Two superpowers invaded uh, Afghanistan to, to show how contentious that portion of territory uh, is, historically speaking. You don't need to go back into the great power game uh, of the 19th century and the Anglo-Russian uh, wars to see how important and strategic this piece of land is, historically speaking. So security is what the Taliban are exhibit internationally, showing that there are no longer uh, thieves, uh, that uh, uh, there are no longer uh, uh, ambushes in the streets. And yet, if you look at the state, for instance, the judiciary is collapsing. Uh, uh, judges, especially female uh, members of the public administration are in a very precarious uh, situation. And along with the, with the judiciary, you see uh, very severe problems in other uh, public goods. Uh, the school system, the university system, mainly private universities are supplementing the, the, the difficulty uh, of the public university system. You see, of course, uh, uh, the economy in a, an economy which was uh, pretty much dependent on international aid and foreign currency in uh, shambles right now. Uh, with uh, uh, a liquidity problem, with uh, uh, skyrocketing prices, with uh, uh, a growth of poverty in the streets, with a disastrous situation in the health uh, uh, sector. Uh, the most pessimistic uh, uh, expectations are that uh, one million uh, uh, children uh, uh, are suffering uh, from uh, severe malnutrition and are at risk in terms of their life during this uh, uh, winter. Um, at the same time, uh, foreign aid is slow in coming due to sanctions. Uh, there are uh, some neighboring states that are, are, are uh, uh, coming with uh, uh, food aid, uh, with the necessary aid, but that creates once again a, a paradox. It's like, you know, we're nourishing uh, Afghan children, but once they are slightly more fed and barely surviving, we can't and we don't. Uh, do more than that. And that's also something that the UN itself, the Secretary General has uh, 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 addressed publicly, the need to ensure uh, 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 that uh, humanitarian aid and, uh, uh, and also that the, 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 the Afghanistan National Bank uh, assets are unfrozen so that uh, uh, the, the population uh, is not paying the price uh, the dire price it's paying for uh, its uh, for its uh, uh, for the war, uh, the diplomatic war that is going on. At the end of the day, I think what we see here is a situation where uh, uh, the to, to quote NATO, which is back into the international debate given the tensions with Russia, uh, where NATO Secretary General General Stoltenberg uh, uh, on the in the aftermath of the uh, uh, flight from Afghanistan of the of the U.S. and its allies said uh, we have there are bitter lessons to be learned from the uh, uh, trajectory of Afghanistan in the last twenty years. Well, perhaps the bit the most bitter is the fate of that civil society that emerged in the shadow of the international intervention that is pretty much articulated that many of us, including in the universities in Italy, are trying to help by offering uh, 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 chances to move, to, 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 to leave the country. Uh, and uh, there is a huge Afghanistan living abroad that is made of those who were evacuated, journalists, people who worked under the, the sponsorship somehow of initiatives that the international community had been organizing and they are now left orphans. But many more are living in Afghanistan. They didn't make it to the airport. Uh, at the time in which the, the path to the airport was constellated by uh, bombs and attacks uh, at the end of uh, August. And this is a major cause of concern because while the, the Taliban have promised an amnesty, so an, an element of discontinuity, 
we see reports of harassment and extrajudicial killings that are targeting those who are suspected to have been part of security apparatuses uh, in the last uh, uh, 20 years. All in all, I think what we get there is a lesson that has to do with uh, uh, the uh, legitimacy of those institutions that were installed and consolidated with a, a major effort, but with little strategic uh, understanding uh, uh, by uh, the US allies in the past 20 years. And when I say little strategic understanding, I'm referring to something quite specific. The fact that for almost 20 years, it was relatively difficult to articulate a critique of the way in which things were going on in Afghanistan. Whenever you would address some critical aspects, for instance, the growth of uh, uh, warlords uh, under uh, the, the so-called American peace or uh, questions of impunity that uh, were uh, left uh, unanswered in, uh, in this long chain of violence that touches basically every family in Afghanistan or when they were touching questions of corruption uh, or the existence of uh, an army that in part was only on paper, it was just there to receive money uh, uh, in spite of the fact that another part of the uh, uh, Afghanistan army was, in, was, was left in a very difficult situation fighting the Taliban themselves. Well, all those critical voices were uh, you know, uh, kept in, a, uh, in on very much on the margins, not very much uh, invited to international conferences when questions related to the national identity or to uh, um, the resilience of the Taliban were raised, uh, well, all of that came uh, uh, with some ease to the public debate. And uh, with, the, with the result that when the Taliban launched their final offensive, they, they just broke through uh, even the rhetorical defenses, not only the military defenses of the Republic of uh, Afghanistan, and the prime minister, the president himself, left the country in spite of uh, declaring many times uh, that uh, they would not, that they were not those who came before them, and they, they left and live in exile, uh, leaving basically no uh, uh, possibility of saying, well, there is an element of legitimacy in the country fighting a resistance, because they left before the international troops. So the Pali Taliban made sure that there was no uh, possible point from which uh, uh, a resistance could be uh, uh, fought. The only resistance which exists, but uh, I have a lot of doubts about how consistent it is militarily, is the one that you can, can be found on some mountains in the Panjshir Valley. But uh, you know, we see some pictures, but it's very difficult to say that there is an armed resistance right now in, uh, in, um, in uh, Afghanistan. So uh, uh, the lessons are bitter. There's a lesson about uh, what we can do with all our uh, beautiful uh, military apparatus and our uh, hyper technology when an army uh, uh, fighting with the rudimentary, relatively rudimentary uh, means, but with uh, a strong uh, sense of uh, uh, motivation and also uh, a strong sense, strong sense of sacrifice. Huh? For instance, when the Taliban attacked the Panjshir Valley, Everybody thought they would find uh, 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 very difficult, uh, a strong resistance, but you know nobody understood that the Taliban were ready to sacrifice thousands of their combatants in, in the field, unlike the others. So this uh, uh, idea, this sense of heroic war that is uh, uh, no longer existing in the Western uh, 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 inspired uh, concept, concept of war has been probably the most important asset that the Taliban have been displaying. And this causes another trouble because the idea is that if money goes back, trickles back into Afghanistan, isn't the Taliban government going to use it for reinforcing its more militant wing, that is uh, uh, martyrs and those who are committed to sacrificing and so on and so forth. So big questions, and I, I, I don't want to go beyond that are left in terms of what constitutes uh, Amr, uh, the concept of authority in the, the, the Quran and uh, the, the, the prescription to obey to authority in the moment in which the uh, Taliban show that power itself is far from uh, uh, stable. There is an attempt, uh, and uh, that's pretty much in line with the 
uh, figure of the emir himself, who's a man of jurisprudence. And you know, in, in, in the Islamic world, power historically is always a matter of equilibrium, pretty much unstable. And, and I'm, 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 I'm aware I'm doing some sweeping generalization here, but between uh, uh, you know, the military power, the, those who fight on the ground, uh, uh, the, the men of law, uh, the jurists, and the people itself, this kind of unstable uh, 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 configuration is pretty much evident today in the case of Afghanistan, but that sends uh, seismic uh, uh, waves to the broader uh, region. Uh, the attempt that has been made to show unity and also to announce, as it was done last week, uh, uh, the, the constitution of uh, a Supreme Court, that is to say the name, uh, we govern in the name of the law. There is a procedure that can contain excesses, that can give a sense of legitimacy. All of that betrays a sense of uh, insecurity, in my view, which is also what the Taliban are trying to uh, project uh, uh, internationally. As we speak, uh, the Ministry of uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is, uh, I think, on his flight, uh, on his way to Norway. For the first time, we see uh, the, 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 the Islamic Emirate projecting itself into uh, uh, Europe. Uh, the discussion will be on humanitarian matters, but this clearly shows uh, how important the question of legitimacy is right now and how connected it is with uh, material problems domestically. Uh, I didn't uh, touch specifically the questions of China, of Russia, of the neighbors, uh, uh, but I think to put it in a nutshell, what we see there is uh, an important chapter of the broader uh, uh, tensions between countries that have committed ideologically themselves to democracy, and we can uh, discuss how deep or how shallow that commitment is and how many contradictions it contains, and at the same time, uh, the fact that authoritarian states uh, in the neighborhood of Afghanistan uh, have created the climate from Iran to, to, to China and Russia in the climate where the Taliban can feel safe in terms of international, uh, international, uh, um, uh, let's say, legitimacy in terms of international a space where they can afford not to be afraid of anyone to intervene uh, and to start a war again. So let me close where I started. The war is over from that point of view. The main challenges are domestic. We don't know. How, how far the winning faction within the Taliban world can handle uh, power in a way that uh, doesn't uh, 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 make contradiction too explosive. And uh, 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 democracies have learned a very bitter lesson that projects itself into broader debates from uh, uh, Southeast Asia to, uh, um, to the, the Sahel, uh, upon which uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, reviews are being uh, uh, underway. Let me close uh, here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Kutari, for this very interesting insight into the domestic and internal dynamics of the country and also how they relate with the external dimensions. So I think indeed it is very important to reflect on the lessons learned from the experience of Afghanistan and to keep the attention on it while during this humanitarian crisis that we're witnessing. So now I'm going to read some of the questions from our audience. And I remind once again that if you want to leave any questions, you can do so in the Zoom chat. So the first one is, um, it appears as if the West, in particular the uh, EU and the US, are choosing not to intervene in the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan in an attempt to weaken the Taliban, evidently leaving in this way the ground to donations and interventions from other powers, such as uh, China and Russia, which you have already mentioned. So uh, what do you think that this could mean for the future of the country, for the future of, of Afghanistan? Well, I mean, um... Perhaps uh, the other guests can, can uh, further elaborate on that, but in a, in a very short way, uh, we are confronted with a dilemma, which is certainly not new. We, we see that in Ethiopia, we see that in, in a number, we see that in Mali today, which is struck by sanctions uh, and where prices of uh, you know, daily use commodities are soar soaring these days. Um, it's a dilemma uh, that uh, uh, I think should be addressed in, in terms of what facilitates transformation and change. 
whether a situation of uh, uh, humanitarian catastrophe is uh, uh, matched by concessions and by a dynamic of change inside Afghanistan. So what works and what doesn't work? And there's an empirical record for that. So far, I believe uh, what we see is that um, you know, the, the severity of sanctions have not played into the, the field of uh, uh, change. And the only thing that has been strengthened is a sense of closure, um, a sense of, uh, you know, resistance by the Taliban uh, power and some openings by those states around. And I, I think Turkey is definitely important in that, from that point of view, because it could, as a member of NATO, uh, play a role together with Qatar. And when we talk about Turkey and Qatar, we should be aware we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, reverberation in the Muslim Brotherhood. We're not talking about any strand of Islam, of political Islam. Well, all of that, I think, uh, uh, plays a role. And we shouldn't be naive uh, uh, and, and forget that, uh, uh, you know, Afghanistan uh, is on the background, or perhaps it's the, the, the tip of an iceberg of a much broader confrontation globally, which is a confrontation between different strands uh, of projects linking uh, the religious re uh, legitimacy uh, uh, within the, the Islamic world to political projects. Uh, and we, sh we shouldn't for a, even a second uh, uh, believe that we live in a post-ideological era. I think in the in, in information age, ideas and ideologies are extremely important. And what happens in Afghanistan itself and, and, and the discussion that we're having about uh, democracy versus uh, uh, you know, pragmatism or authoritarian states that open some credit lines is something that uh, uh, speaks volume to uh, other uh, situations in the world. I think the idea of drawing a line in Afghanistan uh, and you know, showing uh, intransigence in Afghanistan uh, um, might uh, have as a result to have people in Afghanistan pay too high a cost and not contributing particularly to the solution of those dilemmas in the rest of the world. But this is my personal opinion. Perfect. Thank you very much for answering. Uh, our second question from the audience is, uh, since you spoke about propaganda pictures published by the regimes in which uh, Pashtuns and Tajiks sh uh, were showing signs of friendship, the question is how the situation really is in terms of ethical divides between Pashtun and Hazara? Oh, well, this is a vexed question. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, voices coming from Afghanistan that are referring to um, not just discrimination, intimidation and pressure, but also to ethnic cleansing and some uh, refer to genocidal uh, practices. Uh, there are documented uh, episodes. Uh, uh, the Hazara have grown in consideration in the past few years in terms of status, in terms of uh, uh, social standing. And uh, uh, the question of uh, the degree to which uh, uh, the Taliban advance uh, also claims that are associated with Pashtun nationalism um, reopens uh, a, a very problematic aspect of uh, uh, coexistence in the case of Afghanistan. Now, I'm probably the least uh, indicated in going into the details of that, but uh, uh, it is a big issue. Uh, also because, as you know, behind the Hazara, there is a, the, the entire question of uh, the, the unawkward uh, uh, coexistence with Iran that is uh, at the same time in the past few years uh, have, has become, uh, become uh, a reconciled uh, uh, neighbor with, with, the, with the Taliban regime. Um, I mean, we could go on and on and show all the incongruencies. Uh, for instance, one of those elements upon which the Islamic State is pushing, and I didn't talk about that, uh, the Islamic State Khorasan, uh, Khorasan uh, province, uh, is the question of how much the Taliban have been ready to concede and, and, and to shut up in terms of, for instance, the, the fate of the uh, of the uh, Uyghur in China, in, in, in the name of good neighborhood with China. And if you, if you pay attention, you, you, you note that uh, the most important attacks 
mainly the most important one in a military hospital in Afghanistan, uh, was conducted by a, a self-proclaimed uh, uh, Uyghur militant that uh, was infiltrated inside the country and uh, uh, acted as a homicide suicide uh, uh, attacker. So that was a clearly a deliberated uh, attempt on the symbolical level to show that we are far from having a, a ethnic peace or an ethno-national peace in the, in the country and in its neighborhood. Uh, the idea on the part of those, uh, and uh, I'm referring to those who have uh, uh, much more of a, pass me the term, an internationalist uh, appeal, such as the, the Islamic State in this moment, well, the, the claim is uh, that uh, uh, there is no unity, there is no national uh, uh, soul that the, uh, the, the Taliban have been able to sew together, to piece together, to distinguish themselves from the previous uh, Taliban, who are much more assertive in representing only the, the, the Pashtun world. You know, that the Taliban now were successful in going well beyond the, the world of uh, uh, tribal uh, uh, practices and the world of uh, the, the, the Pashto speaking population. And they were able to, to piece together an alliance with the groups in the North, especially. And uh, all of that uh, is shown to be fake in the propaganda of the Islamic State. And uh, the, the, the Islamic State is trying to show that is the Achilles heel of the Emirate. Thank you so much, for, Professor, not only for answering this question, but for all of the precious insights that we gained from your presentation. I'm sure that now we have a lot of new elements to reflect on. So now we, we, we will have to move to the second guest of our panel. So I will leave the floor to Professor Elisa Junki for her presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, uh, Hikma for inviting me, in particular, Julia, Laura, and uh, Francesca. And uh, also it was a pleasure to listen to my uh, colleague and I also wish to thank him for mentioning um, uh, the network SAR, S -A -R, uh, which uh, in Italy and elsewhere in, uh, the, um, uh, in Europe provides uh, help to scholars at risk, including most recently uh, Afghan scholars and students. So you may want to look it up on the uh, internet and look up at uh, its um, activities and uh, activities so far. Um, okay, they, well, um, as my colleague was uh, mentioning, the Taliban take, so, take over, the Taliban, sorry, take over in Afghanistan and raises important questions about the balance of power in the region. And my presentation would focus on the opportunities and risks it entails for two specific countries, Pakistan and, Ra and uh, India, and the approach that these countries have taken so far. Well, uh, it is too early, I think, to assess the impact of the Taliban's return to power uh, for uh, regional actors, but it seems safe to me to state that in many ways, it is good news for uh, Islamabad. Imran Khan can reasonably expect that the Taliban, uh, which uh, were supported by Islamabad in the 1990s and have long had close relationships with Pakistan security services, will take into consideration Islamabad's interests. Well, what kind of interests? Well, first of all, the border issue, which has been poisoning, um, which has been poisoning bilateral relations for uh, several decades, may be resolved or at least put to rest uh, for some time in the name of Islamic uh, Brotherhood. Um, well, the Taliban, particularly the Gilzai, to which the Haqqani network belongs, uh, have not so far seriously questioned uh, the, uh, the Grand Line, the existing border. Uh, secondly, uh, Kabul is likely to stop supporting uh, the Baluchistan national nationalists, who in the last decades, and particularly in the last uh, few years, have attacked state structures and Chinese nationals uh, in uh, Pakistan, threatening to endanger the transport and infrastructure projects linked to the CPEC, the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is probably the most important uh, uh, corridor of the Belt and Road Initiative. That, that, uh, that at least is my opinion. Uh, the Taliban takeover may also be for Pakistan a chance to boost bilateral trade, which has shrunk in the last decade uh, due to uh, worsening relations between uh, Imran Khan and Ashraf Ghani. 
And uh, with Afghanistan pacified under a unified government, Islamabad could also have easier access to Central Asian and Afghan markets and resources. And Gwadar and Karachi could increase their importance as regional hubs uh, linked to uh, global uh, markets. And finally, and I would argue most importantly, uh, Pakistan now will gain a, uh, its long coveted uh, strategic depth while at the same time reducing Indian influence in uh, Afghanistan, something that has greatly worried Islamabad in the last uh, few decades. Well, so basically, I believe that the Taliban's victory is an opportunity for Pakistan, yes, but one that comes with considerable challenges, mostly related to security concerns. Why? Because Islamabad needs to make sure that the Islamic Emirate doesn't provide support and shelter to the TP, the Tariqa Taliban in Pakistan, the so-called uh, Pakistani Talibans, and to similar groups that consider the Pakistani government as un-Islamic. And whether the Taliban comply or not, the rebirth of the Islamic Emirate might by itself reinvigorate these groups. The consequence must, might, might be an increased radicalization of Pakistan's society, and um, this may in turn fuel Pakistan's internal uh, sectarian tensions, as well as the long-standing intra-Sunni violence between the uh, Diobandi Jamiate Ulama and the Baredi Jamiate Pakistan. Uh, notwithstanding these risks, uh, Islamabad seems definitely inclined to recognize Islamic Emirate, but doesn't want to do so unilaterally, fearful of antagonizing the United States. Imran Khan has called uh, um, in several occasions the international community to establish relationships with the Taliban. And it's done so by stressing the consequences that destabilization in Afghanistan would have in terms of refugees and jihadism outside of the region. And so far uh, with limited results, its ultimate decisions um, may uh, partly depend on the ongoing consultations with the extended troika, which aside from Pakistan, includes the United States, China, and uh, Russia. Well, as to the Emirate uh, willingness, willingness to form a more inclusive uh, government uh, to respect basic rights and to shun all links with transnational jihadi movements may pay may pave sorry, the way for uh, acceptance of the Taliban by the West, Islamabad has been trying to exert a moderating influence on the Islamic Emirate. Something easier said than done as the Taliban, uh, as um, uh, I think was mentioned before, is a polycentric movement in which the chain of command is opaque and uh, complicated by uh, external interference by various state and non-state actors. And um, in addition, we have to keep in mind that um, the least uh, uh, inclined uh, to moderation is the Khan network, which according to many analysts has long been supported by the Pakistani secret services and which the Khan networks uh, now controls a third of the uh, um, uh, interim, ad interim government. Uh, Pakistan also needs, needs to avert the risk that the countries that feel or that may feel most threatened by uh, the new political order will support their own Afghan proxies or take advantage of fractures within the Taliban movement. Further, the destabilization in Afghanistan would, among, uh, would, among other things, fuel uh, new flows of refugees to Pakistan a considerable economic burden. Uh, keep in mind that over 10,000 uh, Afghan refugees arrived uh, to uh, arrived in Pakistan in the first half of uh, uh, this year. Well, what about um, India? Uh, well, its policies vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan must be read through the prism of its rivalry with Pakistan, as well as and possibly more so uh, its attempts to extend um, Indian influence beyond the, the South Asian uh, region. In the 1990s, uh, India supported the United Front, the so-called Northern Alliance, uh, which was resisting the Taliban's advance. And following the, decay, the, the defeat of uh, the first Islamic Emirate in 2001, 
New Delhi established uh, uh, warm relations with uh, uh, Karzai. It opened, um, I mean, um, the um, post-Taliban government opened four consulates in Afghanistan. Um, India became the country's main regional donor with projects of great symbolic impact, including the construction of the parliament building, which was completed a few years ago. And uh, India also invested uh, around uh, $3.5 billion in the health, education, and infrastructure sector, sec uh, sectors. An important project was also the construction or the rehabilitation of the road linking Afghanistan to Chabahar, an Iranian port, which New Delhi sees as a counterweight to Badar, the Pakistani port that was uh, upgraded with Chinese uh, funds. In the military field, New Delhi uh, signed a strategic partnership agreement with the Afghan government uh, in, I believe, 2011, uh, committing itself to provide Kabul with training and small arms. Uh, well, uh, what's happened now uh, to Indian hopes and projects? Well, with the rebirth of the Islamic Emirate, Indian investments in Afghanistan and uh, uh, India's extra regional projection are likely to be compromised to the advantage of uh, Pakistan and China. There is also the fear in, in Delhi that uh, um, the Emirate will once again, as in the 1990s, give refuge and aid to Pakistani jihadist groups such as Lashkar e Taiba and uh, uh, Jaisha Muhammad. Um, uh, these two groups have organized uh, in the last uh, uh, two decades uh, several attacks against Indian targets in Afghanistan, in India, and in Kashmir. Well, of course, the recent increase in militant attacks in India uh, controlled uh, Kashmir um, are a source of great worry in New Delhi, though, to be fair, uh, India's unilateral decision in 2019 to, prov to deprive what was called at the time Jammu and Kashmir of its autonomy and the ongoing violations of basic civil and political rights uh, uh, in uh, Kashmir are all factors that are contributing to pushing the Kashmiri youth into the arms of Islamist militants. Uh, so, uh, well, despite all these considerations, uh, uh, it seems uh, likely, I mean, it seems unlikely, sorry, that India will actively support uh, the um, anti-Taliban forces anytime soon, at least this is my opinion, uh, particularly now at a time of heightened border tensions with uh, China and uh, of increased strains with Pakistan over Kashmir. On the contrary, uh, Narendra Modi's government has tried to establish a line of uh, communication uh, with the, the Taliban in the wake of Ashraf Ghani's uh, fall. Members of the uh, Narendra Modi's government met uh, last September, for example, with some prominent figures of the Islamic Emirate in the awareness that the new Afghan government has every interest in reactivating bilateral trade and Indian investments and in diversifying its alliances uh, so as not to depend too much on uh, Pakistan. And in fact, it cannot be ruled out, I would say that the Taliban um, may try to manipulate India-Pakistan rivalry to their uh, advantage so as to receive support and recognition by both. Well, contrary to what uh, Pakistan hoped for, India might thus be able to preserve its interests in Afghanistan and may even decide at some point to recognize the Emirate, though a final decision uh, will be taken in consultation with uh, Russia and uh, uh, Iran, and it's not going to happen in the short term, as no political force uh, in advance of the um, 2024 national elections would want to be seen as making a deal, any sort of deal with a government that is largely seen as a puppet of uh, Pakistan. Well, uh, I don't know if I've talked too much or too little, but anyway, in sum, I would say that Islamabad needs um, the Taliban's help in a way to keep in check the TTP and is trying to moderate the Emirate policies in order to um, have it recognized by the international community to avert the danger of a civil war in Afghanistan, which may spill over into Pakistan. And it's also interested in cleaning up its own image as a country that sponsors obscurantist forces. And uh, it wants, of course, to keep good relations with the United States. 
How to do that without antagonizing the Haqqani group is uh, unclear. Uh, India, well, as to India, well, besides uh, being uh, pro quite pragmatic, as we have seen in its attempt to limit losses in Afghanistan, it is trying to gather, uh, to head a regional consensus vis-a-vis -vis the Emirate. And Islamabad obviously has every interest in preventing India from carving out a negotiating role that may undermine Pakistan's influence on the new political order in Afghanistan. It is, I think, significant that India was invited to the Troika Plus meeting held in Islamabad uh, last November, and uh, neither Pakistan nor China wanted to take part in the regional security dialogue held uh, the day before in New Delhi, which was attended by Russia and the Central Asian uh, republics. Uh, well, Islamabad accuses India of being a spoiler, which as such cannot claim to act as a peacemaker in the region, while India accuses Pakistan of considering Afghanistan a protectorate. And Pakistan's so-called all-weather ally, China, supports uh, Pakistan's attempts to uh, weaken uh, Indian self-assumed mediating role in the region, wary as it is of the intentions uh, uh, of uh, New Delhi, which is considered uh, by Beijing an important pillar of US policy in the Indo-Pacific. In conclusion, uh, India and Pakistan's approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Emirate is, uh, is driven, I think, to a great extent by the geostrategic rivalry between them. And while the rivalry intersects with other regional and extra regional rivalries, Iran, Saudi Arabia, for example, even rivalries within the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, making any attempt to predict the future quite difficult. Well, uh, the Taliban's takeover is uh, uh, likely in the short term, term uh, to further, uh, I believe, Pakistani interests and to antagonize India, thus increasing the chance that India may decide at some point to undermine uh, the Emirate. However, the two governments may ultimately choose a more cooperative path based on their common interests. And here I want to stress that both, after all, want the Taliban to establish a more um, inclusive government and to shun all links with global uh, jihad. And they want them to do so in order to avert instability in their own country in order to increase regional trade exchanges and in order to tap uh, Central Asian and Afghan resources, uh, uh, something essential for their industry and for the uh, rising uh, population. So I would end here, but uh, I am open to um, questions and comments from uh, the audience. Thank you so much, Professor Junki, for this very interesting and insightful presentation. Indeed, yeah. looking, at, looking at Pakistan and India through the lenses of their relations with the new Afghanistan is a much needed, although sometimes maybe overlooked perspective. So now we will read some of the questions from the audience. Um, the first one is uh, concerning the border between Pakistan and Afghanistan. How much do you think that the takeover of the Taliban has or is still affecting the security priorities of their neighbor uh, Pakistan? And has the stance of the two countries on their shared border changed uh, in a noticeable way after the Taliban takeover? Sorry, what it was the last part? You were talking very fast. So how much it is uh, a priority for... Um... For yeah, whether the security priorities of Pakistan has, have changed after the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and um, if the stance of the two countries over the border and security priorities has changed in a noticeable way after the Taliban takeover. Um, yes, I would say that uh, um, the need uh, by Islamabad for uh, Kabul to recognize uh, uh, the Duran line was uh, um, something much more felt in Islamabad uh, um, in the past, certainly in the 50s and 60s. And uh, um, Pakistan uh, in the uh, original scenario, which was feeding into its sort of insecurity, had the need to control uh, the border and to make sure that Pashtun nationalism and uh, may uh, would not feed into other 
internal uh, uh, ethnic based uh, forms of nationalism. So the fear was always, and particularly in the 50s and 60s, I think, uh, in Islamabad, that uh, Pakistan may uh, uh, disintegrate. Uh, due to various uh, nationalist demands that uh, were fuel, uh, fueled, according to Islamabad, by uh, Afghanistan, particularly by India. I would say that uh, since the late 70s, in particular since the 1980s, the stance by Islamabad has slightly changed because the um, the fact that uh, the, con the border is de facto impossible to control uh, became um, somehow instrumental to Pakistani uh, attempts to uh, control its uh, back, uh, backyard and to control what was happening in Afghanistan and uh, uh, in the 1990s and the subsequent decades to, um, according at least to what many analysts say, to help uh, the Taliban and similar forces uh, in uh, uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Because here I want to remind you that uh, uh, Pakistan has long been accused by the United States and uh, uh, to uh, be ambivalent about a uh, war on terror uh, because uh, the border was easily crossed in the last two decades by Taliban militants. Uh, uh, the Taliban uh, shuras um, could freely operate in Pakistani territories, uh, recruit new militants, uh, uh, go back and forth Afghanistan with uh, um, a new uh, with uh, weapons, munitions, uh, and uh, possibly also they had some logistical help from Pakistani security uh, services. Uh, so Pakistan has had an ambivalent role and uh, the, um, uh, let's say the openness, the fact openness of the border has been instrumental according to many um, analysts to uh, Pakistani designs to uh, control what was happening in uh, Afghanistan to control uh, the Taliban. Uh, well, the, I think uh, that uh, nowadays Islamabad also has a, a reasonable hope that um, the Taliban, who are uh, greatly motivated by concepts of Islamic uh, Brotherhood, may overlook uh, the issue of the border and may at least de facto recognize it and uh, do not raise it as an issue that must be resolved in favor of uh, uh, Afghan uh, claims. So basically, the Taliban are likely to accept the Duran line, which is a border uh, that was established in 1840, uh, in 1893. And um, so this is what it can hope. So it can hope that it will, the Taliban will de facto recognize the border. And at the same time, uh, Pakistan knows that uh, it can, uh, if it wants, it can uh, use its porosity to its own advantage. Uh, however, uh, coming to the second part of the question, how the Taliban might feel about it, well, this is an open question. It is true that the Taliban being ideologically motivated uh, um, in religious terms are not, particularly the Hilzai component of the Taliban, are not too interested in uh, nationalist ethnic claims on the Pashtuns living on the south of the border. At the same time, uh, we have witnessed in the last decades an increasing convergence between Pashtun nationalist claims and uh, let's say Islamist uh, uh, demands. And um, so at some point, if this convergence continues, at some point, uh, even the Taliban might uh, um, ask for uh, the Duran line to be, uh, can say, to be questioned. Uh, this is, I mean, we don't know yet what uh, might happen. A uh, final um, point to be made is that, as also my colleague was saying before, we have to keep in mind that the Taliban is a um, polycentric, uh, heterogeneous group where different factions coexist. Some factions um, are more, uh, how can I say, uh, inclined to nationalist uh, Pashtun claims, and some are more ideologically oriented, such as the Akhani group. So an open question is what faction will prevail uh, ultimately? And uh, it's uh, because uh, this will determine, I think, also the position that the Taliban will take vis-a-vis -vis the uh, question of the Duran line.
Okay, thank you very much for this answer. Uh, we have time for just one other question from the audience. And the question is, uh, the government of Pakistan has declared in the past that its influence on the Taliban, uh, it's not as significant as the West has claimed. So what do you think about this affirmation? Yeah, I, um, I definitely agree. I mean, uh, I would think that I would say that Pakistan is definitely the country in the region that for uh, historical reasons, because of its geographical proximity, can exert uh, um, uh, uh, most uh, um, influence over the Taliban. Having said this, uh, I think uh, we tend in the West to uh, overemphasize its capacity to control the Taliban. Uh, one of the reasons is that the Taliban is, as I was saying, made of different groups, and uh, uh, not all of them are. Uh, prone to being controlled by uh, Pakistan, uh, by, yeah, by Pakistan. The Taliban themselves have tried uh, time and again, also in the, in the late 1990s and uh, uh, in the last two decades, to diversify their alliances and have pragmatically chosen to open uh, um, negotiations, uh, even in, before last summer, with other countries, um, the Central Asian Republics, with China, with Iran. Uh, despite differences and with India. And uh, we have seen this trend uh, also continuing after the Taliban's takeover uh, last summer. And uh, uh, the main reason, as I was saying before, is the attempt to uh, not to depend too much on the Taliban, on the on Pakistan, sorry. While Pakistan is uh, an important source, uh, or so many analysts think, of uh, logistical support, of uh, uh, weapons, munitions, uh, know-how, etc. Um, and also of economic support, but we shouldn't forget that the Taliban have been able to uh, get uh, um, support also in economic terms from other sources. For example, in the late 90s, uh, the Taliban also uh, uh, were helped um, economically by uh, Al-Qaeda, which is one of the reasons why it was totally, in my opinion, uh, um, how can I say, um, uh, unlikely that uh, uh, the Mullah Omar would uh, uh, give up Osama bin Laden ex and extradite him to the United States. Uh, the Taliban also in the 1990s and in subsequent decades have relied on uh, money coming from the Gulf countries, uh, from private uh, also um, uh, funds, most of mostly from uh, the uh, from. Uh, um, from uh, Arab countries in the Arab diaspora and uh, from uh, uh, opium, from uh, narco-trafficking. And, uh, and nowadays it is actively pursuing uh, relations with other countries that might, uh, say, that might uh, keep in check. Pakistan's attempt to control um, to control uh, the Taliban. Sorry, it's a complicated issue, and I was trying to summarize it. I don't think I did it very well. But anyway, I hope that what I said was clear. <laughs> It was, thank you very much for this answer. So we now reach the end of, of our first panel. I want to thank again, uh, both of our guests for the very interesting inputs and presentation. I think I speak on behalf of everyone in the audience when I say that this panel and your presentations gave us a new perspective on this topic and definitely a lot of food for thought. So now we will have a small break for five minutes before moving to our second panel, which will be moderated by Professor Silvia Banni and will host the Ambassador Khaled Zekiria. So uh, see you in five minutes. Minutes. So welcome again to all of you. After our short break, we're now moving into the second panel of our conference. So before leaving the floor to the moderator of the second panel, Professor Silva Bagni, let me introduce her to you. So she's an associate professor in comparative public law at the University of Bologna and also member of the UN Harmony with Nature program. Her research topics are constitutional justice, Latin American neoconstitutionalism, ecological constitutionalism, and instruments of direct democracy. So I'm very happy to leave the floor to Professor Bani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you very much for ICMA for uh, having organized this event. Uh, let me greet, first of all, uh, Khaled. It's a pleasure to see you again, even if uh, only online. 
Um, contrary to my colleagues, I have no merits at all in being here moderating this panel because, I have, as uh, Laura said, I am a lawyer, a comparative public lawyer, but I'm, I'm not an expert in uh, uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan law or Muslim law. Uh, my only credit is that uh, in November I organized uh, a conference uh, in, in the seat course uh, in Forli with uh, Ambassador Tecria and I had the chance to uh, knew him personally uh, because uh, uh, we had the chance to organize in, in presence the uh, the conference. So we, we shared a very great time together. Um, so uh, I, I do not want to lose uh, your time uh, and his time. Uh, so I go on uh, presenting and introducing him. Uh, he was appointed in August 2020 uh, as extraordinary and plenipotentiary ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Af Afghanistan in Italy. And he assumed office on January the 6th, 2021. He also represents Afghanistan at the Rome-based agencies and oversees the republics of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Malta, and San Marino bilateral relations in which the embassy of Afghanistan is accredited. Uh, from 2013 to 2020, he was the director general of the fifth political division, Americas, Australia, and New Zealand, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. In the past, it was also um, uh, ambassador in Qatar, and for this, he, is, he received the Sash Merit Award for his uh, work, beautiful work that uh, developed in, in Qatar from 2009 to 2013. Um, I, as I said, had the chance to know him. Uh, and he is a wonderful person, first of all. He is a, a powerful vision of all international relations, not only of Afghanistan, but uh, uh, in a more uh, complex and global level. Uh, so I'm sure that uh, this time that we can uh, have with him will uh, be a, a benefit for, for everyone. So um, Khaled, you have the floor and thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I start with the name of Almighty God. Uh, my dear friend, Professor Sylvia uh, Bonnie, it's nice to see you and also respected professor, dear students, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I, uh, good morning to you all. And I hope uh, you're having a wonderful Saturday. Um, my appreciation goes to, of course, HICMA uh, and also to, uh, to University of Bologna and other entities that have uh, actually put forth uh, this opportunity for me to talk about Afghanistan, specifically as it relates to Taliban's foreign relations um, uh, with neighboring countries and uh, their strategy to stabilize power. Um, I will try to keep my talk very short, so we will give an opportunity for uh, uh, others uh, on the floor to, to pose their questions. So the, as uh, Professor uh, uh, Bonnie has indicated what I will do is I, of course, as a student of uh, structural uh, school of political science, I will be actually looking at things from a global and macro level. Um, what I will do, first of all, is I will uh, employ the, um, the definition of foreign policy uh, to apply as it applies to Taliban's legal problems of having a formal foreign policy. Second, I will talk about Taliban's um, relations and approaches with their natural near neighbors. And of course, from time to time, I may um, talk about the past when they were in power and how history repeats uh, itself uh, during what we call Taliban 2.0 regime. And last, I will provide you with some of Taliban's um, strategies to stabilize power. Um, according to Structural School of Political Science, um, you know, foreign policy defines goals, objectives, strategies, and plans of a state, of a state, which guides the activities in relations of a near, near, actually, namely foreign relations of that state, and of course, sometimes the region 
um, and um, their interaction with other states. Given this, um, this definition, um, uh, the primary and essential ground for government to develop a foreign policy is to have a state. This is very important. Hence, the Taliban's claim to represent a state and develop independent foreign policy becomes problematic for the following reasons. Number one, they do not have a state because they do not have a ratified applicable constitution. And of course, uh, Professor Bonnie can uh, elaborate on that later on. Um, they have adopted uh, the constitution of 1964 or the constitutional um, uh, monarchy era, but unfortunately uh, not in practice. Uh, what they are doing is they basically, um, they, for them, Sharia law supersedes um, um, constitution. Second, they do not have a, they do not have functional institutions inside Afghanistan to deliver services. Hence, they lack performance, uh, uh, internal legitimacy. Third, they cannot conduct relations with other states due to not having diplomatic recognition and not having jurisdiction uh, and access to Afghanistan's missions abroad, including our mission here in Rome. Fourth, they are fully dependent on their client state and other terrorist affiliates to lobby on their behalf and guide them as to how to conduct their foreign relations. Hence, they lack what we call sovereignty and independence. They do not believe in governmental bureaucracy. It's very interesting. Um, nor meritocracy. Uh, professional, uh, professionalism um, is not something that they abide to. So it's basically what they are trying to do is they have monopolized power between their own rank and file. It is Taliban for Taliban. Sixth, the continued presence of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and the emergence of ISIS poses another major problem for Taliban's foreign relations. Uh, though they have assured the international community that uh, Afghanistan will not be used, uh, its soil will not be used any, and, uh, against any other uh, natural neighbor or international community. But uh, based on uh, the fact that um, there has been intermarriages, there has been financial ties, narco trading, narco traffic, uh, arm deals with um, other organizations, especially Al Qaeda, uh, we strongly believe that Taliban are no longer a nationalist movement. They are now an expansionist movement uh, and a threat. And last, um, they have deconstructed Rousseau's uh, very important social contract by is instituting their own social contract with the people of Afghanistan, which is, we give you security, and that is physical security. And in return, you let us determine your freedom and rights based on our own Sharia law. Now, based on these litmus tests, the Taliban's foreign policy fall into the category of what I call uh, client state foreign policy, which is conceptualized as not having full autonomy to prepare and conduct the government's foreign policy actions. However, the Taliban um, claim that they are neutral uh, and they want to pursue the non-interference policy in Afghanistan. Um, they do not have a formal or codified foreign policy, what we call white paper. And I'm pretty sure that you will not see that in near uh, foreseeable uh, future. Now, let me talk about Taliban's um, uh, relation with um, their natural near neighbors, which is, of course, the, the, the interest of uh, today's talk. Uh, we will start with China. Um, for, for China, what is very important um, is um, there are three very important elements. Number one, it has to do with uh, trade and transit routes. Um, as you may all know, around, right now, the Chinese are exporting and importing goods uh, through Central Asia, which is very expensive. So what by having a good friend relation uh, with China, they will be able to uh, you know, collect revenues and taxes um, by, China, by, by, by China trying to uh, transport their goods uh, going through Afghanistan. Uh, number two is, of course, underground uh, exploration of resources, which is very important for China. Um, you know, lithium being one, 
copper being the other, and of course, other precious and semi-precious uh, stones are very important. And the third, of course, what the Chinese want to do is they would like to um, uh, keep uh, the Uyghur movement uh, from, uh, you know, um, infiltration um, in China. Uh, this uh, um, radical Muslim group uh, had a visceral relationship uh, with uh, the Taliban over the years. But now the Taliban have taken uh, power, uh, have assumed power. What they've done is they are they have assured their Chinese, um, you know, counterparts that they will not allow the Uyghur uh, movement to launch uh, attacks uh, against China. Now, uh, second country is of course Russia. Uh, Russia is uh, in a very interesting quandary, um, um, and like China, Iran, it has been gloating over America's uh, departure from Afghanistan. And initially, the, the Russians were very enthused uh, when the Taliban took power. Um, and then even one of their representatives or special envoy, Mr. Kovalov, initially said that uh, the Taliban are far more trustworthy partner than the puppet government in Kabul. Of course, they were referring to the, uh, to the regime, the uh, former regime. Um, however, uh, Russian uh, stance has changed dramatically. Uh, in the past few months. Uh, the Russians, uh, like the Americans, um, basically capitalized on, on, the, on the Doha group, which are uh, made up of so-called relatively moderate Taliban. But now the Russians are um, reconsidering and they're trying to um, actually um, uh, have contacts with um, the holders of authority in Kabul, which are being the Haqqani group, the so-called the radical Haqqani group. Uh, but so far, they have not been very successful. Uh, for Russia, uh, the imminent threat, of course, is uh, radicalism uh, uh, to Central Asia. Narcotics um, is uh, two of the most important um, elements that Russians are very much uh, worried about. Um, Iran uh, is an also in a comparable situation. Uh, again, very happy that uh, you know that Washington um, has departed, um, and I've, they've always looked at it as an America's military defeat must become an opportunity to store life, security, and durable peace in Afghanistan. But also, um, Iran's position um, has uh, dramatically changed in the past three or four months, and what they want in Afghanistan is an inclusive government. Um, so. An inclusive government will be able to maintain, um, uh, you know, uh, an equilibrium and also being able to uh, accommodate other minorities such as the Shia Hazaras in Afghanistan. Um, and um, also, uh, they've been re very, very much an, an, in favor of human rights um, uh, protests in Afghanistan. However, uh, the interest of Iran is very clear. Uh, water is very important for Iran. As you may know, uh, in the last three or four days, uh, Kamal Khan Dam uh, released water. Uh, this happened, of course, pursuant to um, um, Foreign Minister of Taliban's visit to Iran. Um, we do not know what uh, the talks were on, but of course, Iran, for the longest time, um, has um, claimed that Afghanistan should observe um, uh, the treaty uh, that was signed um, uh, in 1961, uh, the water rights. So uh, the water has been released. Uh, we are getting uh, different news. The Taliban claim that they have released it for the province of Nimroz because the peasants demanded that and the Iranians are claiming that an, an, uh, an agreement was made with the government of Afghanistan. So we will, they would be able to use the water on their side of the border. Um, the other issues, of course, uh, alarming for Iran is drugs and, of course, the issue of refugees. We have close to 4 million refugees in Iran, and uh, the Iranians have been very accommodating um, and um, as it relates to Afghans, but this has become uh, a very important problem um, after August 15th. Um, a lot of um, Afghans uh, either go to Pakistan, but the majority of them are going to Iran and from Iran to other parts of the world. 
India, uh, of course, uh, is uh, joining forces with the United States as a strategic partner, and also India has uh, coalesced um, uh, her efforts with Russia and Iran in the past few months through uh, Troika and other organizations. You know, the, the Russians uh, have this very important format, format, which is called the Troika, which they have um, uh, some of the natural, um, uh, actually natural countries uh, in there. So what they want to do is they want to bring Iran and also they want to bring India into this common denominator to create, um, again, a balance. Um, the Russians lately um, are uh, very much concerned about Pakistan's uh, discourse as it relates to Afghanistan. Central Asia, we have Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, Turkmenistan um, has a, a great interest in Afghanistan, um, not only because there are a lot of, uh, we have a small minority of Turkmen in Afghanistan, but also because of the um, pipeline, gas line pipeline, which is called TAPI. And there are other projects that uh, Turkmenistan um, is very much interested in Tapi is uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. It is a um, uh, gas pipeline. It, uh, it was on third phase and it was supposed to start the fourth phase, which is construction. But I think because of the insecurity um, um, on the ground, um, uh, I think uh, this project will not come to fruition. Um, this project will, will not be um, I think um, the Taliban have agreed that they will uh, go ahead and um, um, at least establish a 30,000 um, uh, you know, soldier or 30,000 security personnel for this purpose, but I don't think it's going to happen. Tajikistan, of course, has its um, own other interests that Tajikistan um, currently houses um, um, the um, exiled government of Afghanistan is there. Uh, do, do not officially, unofficially, members of the exiled government of Afghanistan is there. The National Resistance Front uh, members are in Tajikistan. Tajikistan also is looking forward to have an inclusive government in Afghanistan. So uh, the Tajik uh, ethnic group, uh, which is a large minority group in Afghanistan, should have, um, uh, you know, um, uh, political incentives into the new uh, inclusive government. Uzbekistan um, has taken um, sort of an equivocal approach uh, as it relates to Afghanistan. Um, again, there is a large um, uh, minority of Uzbeks in Afghanistan, um, and the Uzbeks um, have had uh, contacts with the government of Afghanistan. They are very much engaged. Um, and, uh, but again, uh, at the end of the day, uh, what really, really matters is uh, Russian uh, influence, these countries being under the sphere of influence of Russia is very important. Um, Pakistan, the Taliban's uh, principal supporter uh, has uh, found itself in a bind uh, lately. Uh, the Pakistani government, especially the military, initially um, welcomed the Taliban. Um, but now the Taliban victory has become a double-edged sword for Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is uh, worried about a couple of issues. Number one is, of course, the Duran line. As you may uh, be aware, uh, in the past uh, two weeks, um, um, in three provinces of Afghanistan, uh, members of the Taliban have dismantled, uh, you know, the defenses that were built on the Duran line by the Pakistani government. Um, so that in itself indicative, indicative of the fact that the Taliban will not accept this door of life as a de jure uh, border uh, because they do not want to alienate uh, the Pashtuns on the other side of the door of life. Um, and of course, in Pakistan, we're having problems in Waziristan. Um, the Pashtuns in Waziristan uh, have shown um, enormous support uh, for the people of Afghanistan against the Taliban. Uh, the leaders from time to time, they have echoed sentiment of solidarity uh, with the Pashtuns in Afghanistan against the Taliban. Baluchistan or the Baluch uh, in that area, um, of course, or have also had, um, uh, you know, uh, periods of unrest. And there was a protest about a month ago, close to uh, 5,000 to 7,000 Baluchis uh, took the street. 
um, demanding uh, rights and demanding um, a, you know, uh, equal opportunity um, uh, and also uh, providing them with um, uh, economic incentives in, that, in the region. There is internal rifts between ISI and the civil government that is uh, uh, also very uh, troubling as it relates to Afghanistan. And of course, the valuation of, of, of rupees and also inflation and furthermore, energy crises. Pakistan is faced with uh, um, inevitable energy crises and by 2023, both India and Pakistan will face this difficulty. And what makes it far more uh, troubling is, of course, TTP, Tahrik Taliban in Pakistan. It's the Pakistani Taliban, which um, uh, you know they had a ceasefire for a month, but they have started. They have restarted their uh, terrorist activities in in, in in Pakistan. Saudi Arabia uh, has been uh, replaced. Uh, by uh, her rivalries, uh, by her rivals such as Qatar and UAE, um, Qatar, um, you know, uh, because of having uh, this ambition in, in in Gulf states, have been very much engaged um, as it relates to Afghanistan, um, and um, and UAE also has economic interests um, in Afghanistan, uh, and as you know, the Qatar the Qataris and in Turkey, they are basically very much interested in, in having um, various uh, contracts. Um, having five airports contracts, I think they've agreed, you know, preliminary agreements were made that they will take the management of uh, Kabul International Airport, mazar sharif and three other provinces. Um, now uh, that I've given you a kind of an overview of, of, of the relations, I think what I'll do quickly is I will talk about uh, Taliban strategies of how they want to stabilize their power. Um, their first initiative is to use humanitarian assistance uh, for their own and benefit and also for Pakistan's benefit. Um, they are trying diligently to, to encourage or even, even pressure the international community to provide the aid directly to them. Um, and um, as you may recall in 19, where you, most of your students are very young, but I may recall, um, I recall that back in 1980s, 1990s, there was the same situation. Most of the humanitarian aid that came to Afghanistan, Pakistan was the agent. Uh, Pakistan was at the forefront of basically uh, distributing the aid and also monitoring the aid. Um, so this is also, again, a repetition of 1980s and 1990s. The second initiative has to do with the fact that they want to exert pressure on the international community um, uh, to, uh, for recognition in exchange for humanitarian evacuation. This is something that they've been doing um, on, on a lot of countries, especially in the EU. The third thing um, uh, to basically uh, for the Taliban to, um, to, to stabilize their power is to cultivation of energy companies and energy pipelines, as I alluded earlier, TAPI, CASA 1000, and also collecting revenues. This is again very much um, in line with 1995 when they wanted the US corporation Unocal um, and also Saudi corporation built on oil. Uh, they signed a memorandum of uh, intent um, uh, with the government of Turkmenistan and with these other entities. Um, the Taliban wanna generate revenue from uh, the construction of these pipelines and service of these pipelines. Fourth has to do with the exploitation of trade and transit route for Pakistan and China uh, and other interested neighbors. As I said, um, once um, uh, in that the Chinese are very much interested to use this for their one built one road initiative. So they wanna generate revenue through that. Uh, another initiative is to keep India as far apart and as isolated as possible. And I think one of the main reasons that Pakistan has supported the Taliban to come to power is to keep India isolated. Uh, so this is another way of, of, uh, of maintaining the support of Pakistan. Um, and of course, also maintaining the support of China because China and India are rivals. The other um, issue is of course, uh, uh, raising revenues from opium production. Um, the Taliban, since they have taken power by force uh, on August 15, uh, they've not had any form of uh, announcement or a decree or any form of uh, legal 
um, uh, you know, at least a regulation or a law, uh, basically talking about uh, counter counter narcotic efforts. So I think this would be this is going to continue to be a very large uh, source of revenue for them uh, to uh, continue, uh, you know, buying weapons and, and and dealing with their affiliates. The other issue is, of course, um, institutionalization of insurgency uh, and terrorist tactics into the mainstream uh, um, form of government. Uh, as you know, that the Ministry of Defense of the Taliban, what they've done is they have basically uh, created uh, brigades, which are called the martyrdom brigades. So suicide bombing has become now a new, a new form of um, institution for DOD and also for the police. And this is a, a, um, actually another form of basically empowering themselves and also showing force and might against natural and near neighbors. Um, the issue that's very important, of course, is the issue of what we call gender egalitarianism or equality, which is based on, um, you know, bringing, uh, at least keeping the Western uh, international community, um, you know, at least uh, keeping them calm and saying that, listen, we are going to provide uh, the women and girls in Afghanistan with um, uh, you know educational higher educational opportunities and so forth and so on their tactic is giving excuses delaying and employing their own brand of communication um, um, and actions in afghanistan um, every time and this is again if you go back to 1996 uh, their excuse was always this oh we don't have security women are not safe to attend you know high school and attend higher education we need to first provide full security and then they can go to school. So this is basically the same um, excuse. Um, the relationship with the Taliban, with the UN agencies and regional organizations such as EU and OIC and other NGOs is very interesting as well. The relationship has been very tense in 1990s but now they are trying very hard uh, to uh, give a better image of themselves. Um, and again, uh, this is only probably because they want to get recognized. I think after recognition, the situation will again uh, turn back to 1990s. Um, so this is another uh, issue they are working uh, very hard on. Um, and last but not least, <laughs> What, what is very important is, despite the war of wars against the United States and calling the US you know, a defeated power, uh, the Taliban um, are uh, working very hard to negotiate with the United States because they believe that the only path to recognition goes through Washington. Um, uh, and um, I think uh, now that they are in Norway, uh, let us not forget the Americans are also going to be present there. So the issue of U.S. assistance is very important for the Taliban. This is about it. Um, what does the future hold? Um, this I'm just going to say something else about the future. Um, I strongly believe that the war is not over. Um, you know. Um, Earlier, the professor said the war is over. I think kinetic war is over in Afghanistan, but we are going to be faced with a new form of warfare in Afghanistan. Um, um, and um, it is going to be um, a different type of uh, conventional warfare. As I alluded earlier, we are going to have martyrdom brigades. This, this, uh, this new uh, so-called um, uh, Taliban um, uh, defense and security force that is going to be, uh, that they're working on, which is going to be anywhere between 80,000 to 100,000, is going to be uh, a, a danger for the region. Um, um, with that being said, what are the, the probable scenarios? I think um, we could have uh, three probable scenarios with in, in the future of Afghanistan. We could have fragmentation and collapse. Uh, we could have um, national uprising and collapse. Uh, or we can have an inclusive gover uh, government where the international uh, community will, uh, you know, at least exert pressure on the Taliban 
uh, and some form of inclusivity will come out of it. Um, I strongly believe uh, that um, that inclusivity and inclusive government um, maintaining women's rights, girls' rights, minority rights, it's not going to happen because the Taliban, by doing that, they will alienate their uh, foot soldiers and rank and file and other, other groups uh, that support them, especially the Akhani group. Um, um, but uh, the fragmentation and collapse is imminent. What we need to do is we need to have an alternative in case that there is going to be a political vacuum to fill it. And uh, not only a political vacuum to fill it, but I think peace uh, keeping the United Nations peacekeeping forces would be an alternative uh, if that happens. Um, an interim government, if the collapse uh, will occur, and then after that, maybe uh, after one or two years, um, uh, at least um, an election um, uh, where the people would, would be able to vote. Uh, you know, for their um, favorite group or favorite candidate. That is, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Khaled, for this uh, very bright and clear picture that you have made and you have confirmed what I said before, that the, the vision that you have is, is really um, global uh, and, and uh, it, it shows a, 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 an insight uh, of and, and knowledge of all the relationship uh, of the the country and the continent that is uh, is amazing. Um, so let's give a space to the questions of the audience. Um, the first one, many researchers and experts uh, have underlined that the engagement from China towards the Taliban. How do you think that China's presence in the country could affect both its internal and external dynamics, considering that China was the first foreign country to pledge emergency humanitarian aid to Afghanistan? Okay, um, as far as the uh, Chinese engagement um, is concerned, and, um, and as it relates to its internal and external dynamics, uh, we have to understand uh, that China and Afghanistan uh, have a very long history um, together. And the Chinese, um, um, they do understand Afghanistan uh, very much. Um, the Chinese, what, what really, really is very important for China right now is of course economic expansions. And, and of course the one built and one road initiative is something that is very, very important for China. And then actually, unfortunately, because of what has going on in Afghanistan, um, this uh, one built and one road initiative um, has really, really uh, been sort of scaled back. Um, so the Chinese want to accelerate this. And the way, the only way they can accelerate it is through um, uh, regional connectivity. And that regional connectivity I, I alluded earlier, um, I, you know, initially um, in 2004 and 2005, the Chinese were not interested to bring Afghanistan into this one, uh, one built and one road initiative um, because of insecurity inside Afghanistan as um, it, uh, you know, the deterioration of security from 2004 uh, downward, it got really, really bad. But then later on, the Pakistanis, uh, they encouraged the Chinese to, to revisit this and come back and then at least bring Afghanistan some forward shape. Now, Afghanistan is fully into in the picture, actually. The Chinese are very much interested to basically, you know, utilize parts of Afghanistan to one build, one road and finish. That's one. Number two, which is very important for China, I think, for the the Chinese is raw material. You know, it's very, very important for the Chinese, especially the underground resources of Afghanistan. The underground resources have been very of paramount importance for the Chinese. Um, in the past, the Chinese were faced with um, um, competition when it came to, to betting and all that. But now what the Chinese want is basically access, full access. And I think the Taliban will provide him with that. Also, Pakistan is very much interested in, in bringing the Chinese together because of the strategic partnership Pakistan and, 
in, in, in China have. Believe it or not, in, um, um, in, nine, in 2005, 2006, 2007, up to 2011, a study was made. In provinces where the Chinese had projects, the Taliban never attacked those, uh, those uh, projects because of the fact that uh, that the, 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 uh, the Pakistanis were, were, were basically instructing the Taliban that you have to maintain these projects. Um, so there is that relationship. And of course, as I alluded earlier, what is important for China is China wants to go directly from Afghanistan to Iran, and then from Iran would like to have access to, to, to Europe. Um, right now, uh, China is faced with um, with an enormous problem of going to Central Asia. And of course, Central being Asia being under the sphere of, 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 of Russian Federation, sometimes there are impeding constraints for the Chinese good to make it to Europe. So that, that is of course, and of course, as far as the Uyghurs are concerned, that is an element that really, really worries the Chinese. Because at the end of the day, the Chinese know that ideological affiliation is far more stronger for the Taliban. For the Taliban, then economic affiliation, because Taliban is the Taliban movement is an ideological movement. Because sooner or later, you know, they have they would have no other choice to side with their so-called Muslim Uyghur brothers. So this is what I have to say about China. And of course, China is very much interested in terms of keeping India as far, you know, away. Uh, as it can from Central Asia. This is another goal that China, China has. It's, there's a um, you know, big competition between China and India as to who would prevail in the next five years, at least in the economic scene. And of course, when it comes to democracy, of course, there's I mean, China is a diff has a different regime. But as far as production is concerned, um, um, and of course, as far as military might is concerned, uh, let us not forget that uh, that um, India, in some aspects, supersedes China, especially when it comes to naval power. So you think they can be the, the first investor in reconstruction? They will be the first investor. Um, and um, um, they are right now, as we speak, in Afghanistan. Um, um, I do not know. We have heard uh, news, imagine, imagine when the Americans left the background base, uh, pursuant to that, the Chinese were there for two days because everyone was shocked around the province. What were the Chinese doing? Because the whole entire background base was, uh, uh, you know, uh, electrified. And, you know, <laughs> the Afghan government doesn't have that, that power. You know, the electrification of the, the, the background base is very big. So we knew the Chinese were there. And I think some um, have indicated that they brought all of the instruments that are needed. And right now, as, as, as I've heard, you know, exploration uh, has started, at least in some parts of Afghanistan. It could be illegal that we do not know. Uh, another question. It appears uh, as if the West, uh, EU and US, are choosing not to intervene in the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan in an attempt to weaken the Taliban. Um, do you think this is the right way to act, or in this case, not to act? I think because of the enormous pressure exerted on the United States and on the West uh, through uh, regional countries, of course, the media, uh, humanitarian organizations uh, in the United Nations, other uh, international organizations, also uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, the United States and the West has, they have changed uh, their posture as it relates to humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan. Initially, um, I tend to agree, initially the, the, the you know, the the approach was that, well, let's, let, let us exert pressure on the Taliban, you know, but um, I, I think I myself in the beginning I've encouraged both the House, of, the House of Deputies and also the Italian Senate that we need to engage with the Taliban and we need to send humanitarian assistance. What is very important is at this juncture is that humanitarian assistance should not go directly to the Taliban. 
We have accounts with humanitarian assistance in some parts of the country have been given to the Taliban. Guess what has happened? They have basically distributed those aids to their own rank and file, their own members of the Taliban or the families of the martyrs, of their martyrs. So I think we should engage and we should continue with the humanitarian assistance because at the end of the day, the people of Afghanistan are going to suffer, but we need to have a mechanism. Uh, and of course, I don't know if you recall, uh, um, Sylvia, I, I, I was working and I gave a policy uh, a brief to the uh, government of Italy. We wanted to create what was called you know, an Afghanistan special monitoring unit. So we need to have a monitoring unit. And I think the presence of EU right now, you know, they're gonna be opening their, uh, you know, their mission in Afghanistan. I think it's a good way of monitoring that the aid that comes to Afghanistan will not go through Pakistan, will not go through to the Taliban, to Afghanistan people. But I'm gonna tell you something. In, uh, last uh, night, I got a very interesting tweet from a very a prominent member um, uh, of the UN organization. I'm not going to name who, but um, it was indicated that, um, uh, believe it or not, most of these UN agencies now, they're employing Pakistani professionals and members of the Taliban. So this is questionable. I mean, these are, we're talking about these organizations that distribute aid. Uh, why is it that they don't want to employ Afghan women, Afghan men? You know, we have uh, it, this. This. This is this is something that reminds, brings me back to 1980s and 1990s. So we need to be very careful that the aid that goes to Afghanistan will not go through Pakistani channels and through Taliban channels, because at the end of the day, the people of Afghanistan will again become disenfranchised. Of course, it's very clear. So you think we, we need a position there, we need a contact there in, in order to have direct information, yes. not, yes. not through the Taliban's. We need, to have, we need to have a monitoring mechanism that oversees humanitarian assistance, evacuation process, um, um, human rights violations are being reported. Who reports it? People, civilians, social through social media even now they're silencing those voices as well you know and of course now they're they're coming up with their own protests yesterday they came up with their own protests they brought these women with 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 their burqas and they were saying oh we want to you know maintain that and then later on some of the women indicated that we were forced we were we were we were actually asked to leave our madrasas and go and protest in favor of the hijab you know so I mean, these strategic communication in these um, you know, um, approaches by the Taliban has become very clear to the international community, but we need a monitoring mechanism. Um, I have two more questions. I think that we can, I, I can read it for you both uh, so that you, you can organize a, a, a unique answer in, in terms of, in particular, looking at, at the time. Um, the first question is, what do you think is going to happen internally in the country due to the dissatisfaction for the Taliban's conquest? which are the solutions provided by the international community in the Republic of Afghanistan to protect civilians. This is the first one. And the last one, since Taliban's are planning to construct gas pipelines, may they use their energy companies as a diplomatic tool in front of Europe that is facing energy crisis and is reluctant in approving the Russian Nord Stream 2 and therefore boost for recognition through energy pressure? Let me answer the second question first. As I alluded earlier, um, um, one of the important parts of my talk was what had to, it had to do with how the Taliban, how the Taliban are basically stabilizing their power. And I indicated that just like 1980s and I'm sorry, 1990s, the Taliban are using this, this construction of not only gas pipeline, but also uh, electricity uh, lines, uh, water dams, um, water channels, uh, for what? To exert pressure and to influence the international community 
to recognize them. What we've seen in Iran is a prime example, letting you know the dam uh, over there, Kamal Khan Dam, the water to run uh, to toward Iran is indicative of the fact that the Taliban are basically you know selling water perhaps for recognition. That could be, you know, of course, we do not know anything about the facts, but uh, this is, of course, um, something that, that we can analyze from the situation. As far as um, um, energy crises, uh, not only energy crisis in Pakistan and India, also energy crisis going toward the West, of course, they will be using these uh, pipelines in some form or shape because at the end of the day, these pipelines will have amplification effects and connections to other parts of the, of the region, especially through Eastern and of course, Western Europe, and also even coming to other parts of uh, Turkey and Iraq and every, uh, everything else. I mean, I mean I'm, I think in foreseeable future, you will see that. And of course, this is of course aligned with the One Belt, One Road initiative too. If you look at the map and you superimpose their maps, they're very much congruent to what's really going on in that part of the world. Now, as far as what, what do I think about the dissatisfaction of the internal dissatisfaction of the people against the Taliban um, and, how, and how, how to protect their rights, I think. Um, I spoke to someone the other day, it was very interesting, this man, um, uh, and I just want to say he is a Pashtun like me. First of all, the, the Pashtuns sub, do not support the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban do not represent the Pashtuns. They don't support, they don't represent any ethnic group in Afghanistan. They are an alien phenomena for, for us. We've never seen anything like it. Oh, we saw, we witnessed it in 1996, 2001, but we, these, the, Burqa and all these things are very alien to us. Their brand of Islam, they claim, uh, is unique. They don't think Saudi Arabia, UAE, Qatar, Pakistan, Iraq, they said these are not Islamic countries by their standards. They are very, supposedly they have very high standards. But um, the dissatisfaction is, I think, um, an, an element that I said uh, in the last part of my talk that could lead to an uprising in Afghanistan. You know, the people of Afghanistan are known not to accept invaders. And they look at the Taliban as invaders. Um, when the Americans came to Afghanistan, um, and even if you look at some of these surveys, 2018, 2019, even up to 2020, surveys were done by various entities, um, domestic and international. If you would have asked an Afghan, do you consider the presence of the international community in Afghanistan as an invasion? 78 to 81, 82 percent of Afghans would say, no, this is not an invasion. And if you would have asked them the second question, are you happy with what the international community, especially the U.S. and NATO allies and EU is doing in Afghanistan? The majority would have, of them would have said, no, we're not happy. You know, they have to change their approach in Afghanistan. So they never looked at the international community's presence as an invasion. And as you know, that they, from time to time, and even now they hope that there's going to be re-engagement by the United States and our, our, our NATO allies in the EU and Afghanistan. Um, so this, this, uh, this satisfaction, I think, human rights violation, um, and of course, with the National Resistance Front uh, in Afghanistan, with the exiled government uh, working, you know, um, uh, diligently, you know, to at least have a territory to announce, you know, the new structure. Uh, I think that in itself would be a catalyst for national uprising against the Taliban. And this national uprising against the Taliban could lead to a fragmentation, where the moderate Taliban will join the national uprisings. Um, against the, the radical Taliban. Would that happen? It could happen because at the end of the day, I think Pakistan, I strongly believe Pakistan has realized that the Taliban is not a group that they can deal with. Um, because now that you have given a terrorist organization territory, uh, you know, political incentives, uh, weaponry, um, ambition, and of course, uh, uh, at least a sense of unity with other affiliates, terrorists, it's very difficult to contain them.
uh, the, Pak the Pakistanis are very much alert and they know that at the end of the day, there has to be, there has to be at least, um, at least, if, at least some sort of moderation has to come within the, within the Taliban regime. Uh, but I, I don't think that's going to be imminent. Um, the ones that are so-called moderate, they have peripheral power, and there are few of them. The ones that have central power are the most powerful, and they are their relationship with Al Qaeda is something that is um, a, a danger. And they have also relationship with ISIS, believe it or not. You know, they, though we the, the West says that the ISIS, you know, is, is a is a different group, but at the, the, the end of the day, ISIS was formed by members of the Taliban. Um, so um, the future is, I think future is an either fragmentation and collapse or uprising, you know, uh, and collapse. But either way, we need to have a viable alternative. And that viable alternative, I'm not saying this because I represent Islamic Republic, but, but that viable alternative is what? The exile government is very important. And we're working on that diligently to, to make sure that we will announce at least a structure for that and we make sure that they will have at least foot, a foothold within the territory of Afghanistan. And so in case of that happens, they will be able to at least fill the vacuum um, in peacekeeping. Um, I'm working on a proposal right now. Peacekeeping forces of the United Nations is very important because I don't think the United, the United States in EU and NATO forces will ever re-engage in Afghanistan militarily. So we need to have a viable alternative, you know, to maintain peace toward the formation of an inclusive government if the Taliban collapses. Anything else? I'm 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 ready. So thank you very much. Uh, I I for uh, time reason I have to give the floor immediately to the organizer, the ICMA representative. Thank you very much to you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We arrive at the end of this event. I really, really want to thank you all our guests, the Professor Strazzari, the Professor Junki, our Professor Silva Vanni, and the Ambassador Zikrija. It was a huge, huge uh, pleasure to listen to you today. So really thank you so much. And I also want to thank you all the participants and the, of this event. I hope you enjoy it. And I remind you, if you want to follow us to remain uh, of our um, social media. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to echo Francesca in thanking everyone, of course, all of our guests, also the Squadra Ospiti of ICMA and everyone in ICMA that made this conference possible. I remind you that in the next days, you will find the recording of this conference on our website. And I invite everyone to follow all of our work and see you in our next conference. Have a good day.